Thank you for joining me once again as we resume our studies in the Gospel or the Good News of Mark. Today we come to a section of Mark's book that is familiar both to Christians and in fact many non-Christians. Jesus' story or parable about a sower. However, though we may know the story, it may still hold some challenges for each one of us, so please keep listening. But first, let's begin by reminding ourselves of Mark's record of this story of Jesus. He tells us, Again Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake, while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered, because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew and produced a crop, some multiplying thirty, some sixty, some a hundred times. Then Jesus said, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing but not perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding, otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy, but since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some thirty, some sixty, some even a hundred times what was sown. In our previous studies we've discovered that the storm clouds were already lowering around Jesus and his ministry. So while Mark reminds us here that vast crowds were still seeking him out, this is far from the full picture. In the previous sections of Mark's Gospel we've seen Jesus forthright forthrightly rejected by the religious and intellectual elite of his day. We observed him being sought out by the crowd, but for the wrong reasons. He was even misunderstood by his own family. Only the little band of disciples and their, their adherents mentioned here by Mark, only they seemed to be standing by him for any length of time, and they too were pretty muddled about him. For Jesus this must have been a lonely experience and one full of foreboding. However, Mark does not dwell on this here. Rather, he speaks of Jesus' little band of friends who, for whom perplexity must have accompanied most of their waking moments. Questions must have filled their minds. If this is the promised king, where is the evidence of his rule? Why is it that men and women do not submit to him? When will his kingdom rule as the promised Messiah commence? Questions such as these continue to perplex Christian believers. The pressures on each one of us and our churches can raise even today similar questions. And of course, such questions are inevitably going to be asked by those who are exploring the Christian faith. 
Jesus' response here was to tell a parable. Parables were a well-known means of teaching in Jesus' time. They were stories intended to illustrate or emphasise some point or spiritual truth. So Jesus tells his story. Perhaps as he looked up to the surrounding hills, he saw a sower going about his work. What is certain is that those in his audience would have been very familiar with both sowing and the different yields that followed. Yields that were dependent upon the preparation of the field, the soil quality and the quality of protection offered to avoid the seeds being used as a bird feed. There can be little doubt but that Jesus' hearers would have enjoyed his storytelling, but what would they have made about his challenge? Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Jesus was clearly challenging his hearers and us to think. Sometimes the best way to teach is not to provide all the answers, but to invite those who are studying to try and work the answer out for themselves. This can often lead to a greater grasp of what is being taught. However, at this stage of his ministry, even the disciples needed some help. So in response to their question, Jesus invited them, as he invites us, to reflect upon what he believes is fundamental to his message. At the heart of Jesus' teaching here is the little phrase, the kingdom of God. As Jesus' ministry developed, he used this phrase or something like it many times. The phrase itself invites us to work out exactly what Jesus means. Simply, whether it's applied to us as individuals, communities or the world, it refers to God's active rule. Here, Jesus has ordinary people like you and me in mind and emphasises that the presence of God's rule depends upon the response of individuals and communities, that's us, to what Jesus calls the seed. Jesus then explains that the seed is what he calls the word. It's interesting that he does not use the plural words. This suggests that he's referring not simply to words, sentences and the like, but to a message as a whole. This again invites us to ask what is the message and who is the messenger? And it seems very clear from the way Jesus speaks here that he believes the answer to both questions is him. He is both the messenger and his is the message. So Jesus is affirming what has been consistent, his consistent message so far in this book. He's the one who is promised and we're to listen to and follow him. Put differently, he is God's word. This leaves us, of course, with many of our questions about the kingdom of God unanswered. And for the time being, Jesus avoids many of them. What he wants to especially point out is that the kingdom grows in individuals in response to their willing acceptance of him. It's almost as if he is saying, forget for a moment the big questions you have, because the start to obtaining your own answers lies in how you receive me and my message. And I think this is the point that Mark wants to make too. Everyone who has a mind to think We'll have questions about Jesus, but he implies the best way to find answers is to be open to him. However, Jesus indicates first of all that there are a number of reasons why people fail to respond appropriately to him and his message. He begins then by suggesting that sometimes his message is never given a chance. Just as hardened soil makes germination impossible, so there are those whose hearts and minds are so implacably opposed to him, like the religious and social leaders of his day, that welcoming his message is completely ruled out. He and his message is simply never given a chance. Others, like the shallow soil, may offer a brief, even enthusiastic welcome of him and his message. But the welcome is super superficial. This, as we have already seen, was often true of the crowds who accompanied Jesus. They didn't really grasp either him or his message, and their initial excitement quickly ebbed away, especially if trouble was brewing. Jesus' point is therefore getting to know him and understand his message requires more than a passing interest. Rather, it demands serious intent. 
Still others, Jesus suggests, become preoccupied with the obstacles that seem to accompany seeking to spend time with him and his message. Rather, as weeds choke the growth of a crop, so growing in the knowledge of him can be destroyed by such distractions. So simply, Jesus reminds us that it's all too often true that the word is given no chance at all, that it can be responded to possibly enthusiastically but shallowly, or that legitimate pleasures become inordinate or difficulties are not seen as occasions for growth but choke spiritual life to death. These and other things in us can so often lead to no growth or a slow and stunted response. However, this is not Jesus's final word. There are those he teaches that do receive the message. They prove suitable soil, prepared and ready to receive him. At this point, Jesus must have caused people to sit up. All that he's described so far was familiar to every member of a society in which agriculture lay at its very heart. While returns were seldom great, Jesus refers to an extraordinary, even supernatural harvest. He speaks of 300, 600, even a thousand percent returns. Such a promise must have woken up a drowsy listener. What point then is Jesus making? We've noticed that Jesus began this parable by referring to the rule of God. Then, as he tells his story, it's clear that his illustration focuses upon the growth of God's kingdom in the individual. He's concentrated upon specific people or groups of people. In each case, he's shown that he's discussing individual responses to him and his message. So that must still surely be the point here. If so, Jesus implies that those who are ready to welcome him will experience a fullness of life that surpasses anything that can possibly be imagined. Millions of people who have become Christians down the centuries would agree. To know Jesus and to hear him speak to them has made them willing to give up everything, even their lives, for him. The little band of followers around Jesus had much to, still to learn. Doubtless they wanted a complete course on the kingdom of God and how, when and where it would appear. Jesus understands this, but he also knows that the rule of God begins when one human heart opens itself to him and his words. So this is where he starts his teaching, both inviting us to welcome him for ourselves and to be sure that we're not those who will never experience the joys of fellowship with God because we either refuse to be interested never take time to really follow through with our interest or become preoccupied with other things and no longer have the time for him and his ways. Rightly then, Jesus says and says it to us, may those who have ears to hear really listen. <laughs>